This Brigham Young University devotional by Christine Hansen was given July 3rd, 2001. Christine Hansen earned her bachelor's degree in English and a master's degree in teaching English as a second language from BYU. She received her PhD in English from the University of Texas at Austin. In 1987, Dr. Hansen became a BYU faculty member. Professor Hansen teaches courses in advanced writing, rhetoric, pedagogy, and research methods. She wrote the textbook currently used for English 315 classes. Dr. Hansen served as the coordinator of the English Composition Program. She currently serves as the Associate Dean of General Education and Honors. Professor Hansen has been honored with the Carl G. Mazur Professor of General Education Award. She is also president of the BYU Faculty Women's Association. Sister Hansen is from Delta, Utah and served a mission to Germany in the early 1970s. She has held many different church callings since her mission. Currently, Sister Hansen is a Cub Scout den leader in the Orem Park, Third Ward. In her spare time, she enjoys hiking, biking, bird watching, and reading. We will now be privileged to hear from Sister Hansen. I am humbled by the invitation to speak today. As I have prepared my remarks, I have had particularly in mind the 900 new freshmen who arrived on campus less than two weeks ago. The rest of you will, I hope, find something of value in what I say, but I especially pray that I can help the youngest students among us understand some of the unique opportunities that lie before you. I have entitled my remarks, Lift Thine Eyes to the Mountains. This title is inspired by an experience I had two years ago. I liked to vacation in the mountains, yet until the summer of 1999, I had never traveled to nearby Wyoming to visit the Grand Tetons. A friend and I arrived at the National Park in the late afternoon. As we drove along the park road to get closer to those majestic peaks, we noticed an area where we could pull off and read signs telling us the names and geologic history of the mountains. As we stood outside the car, drinking in the beauty of the scene, a van pulled off the road and parked beside our car, and a couple, probably in their early 40s, got out to admire the mountains, too. I noticed that the license plate on their van indicated they were from one of the flat Midwestern states, and I thought perhaps the mountains would be especially awe-inspiring to them. As I turned to go back to the car, I noticed in the rear of their van two teenage boys, presumably the sons of this couple, seated with their backs to the Grand Tetons and showing absolutely no interest in looking at them. One boy had headphones on and his eyes shut, apparently caught up in whatever he was listening to. The other had his nose in a magazine, doggedly reading, seemingly oblivious to the beauty that surrounded him. Now, I don't know why these two boys were ignoring the view. Maybe it was the last day of their trip and they had already seen enough. But unfairly or not, I imagined that they had come on vacation at their parents' insistence. And now, just to show how cool they were, they were refusing to be impressed by the sights their parents had brought them to see. As I drove away from this family, I thought that many of us often behave in the way these boys did. There are inspiring things our Father in Heaven wants to show us and wonderful experiences He wants to give us. Yet we are so absorbed in trivial worldly interests that we sometimes turn our backs to the thrilling views of eternity that are available if we would only lift our eyes and see. <clears throat> Today my desire is to help us all lift our eyes and see the heights to which we may aspire if we will take full advantage of the opportunities offered us here. Brigham Young University exists in large part to help the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints fulfill its mission. The mission of the university, as stated in this little blue booklet, is to assist individuals in their quest for perfection and eternal life. The mission statement declares that all students at BYU should be taught the truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Any education is inadequate which does not emphasize that His is the only name given under heaven whereby mankind may be saved. As President Spencer W. Kimball said in a 1967 address, BYU should provide education for eternity. The faculty here, he stated, have a double heritage and a double responsibility to preserve and teach not only the knowledge of men, but the revealed truths sent from heaven. Included with the mission statement in this booklet are the aims of a BYU education, approved by the Board of Trustees in 1995. 
The four aims are to enlarge the intellect, strengthen the spirit, build character, and prepare for lifelong learning and service. We faculty members are frequently encouraged to read this booklet and to incorporate the four aims into our teaching. Yet I wonder how often students take the time to read and ponder the words that elaborate on the four aims. I hope that you will read the complete statement of the mission and aims. They are available on the internet as a link from the BYU homepage and are also printed in the catalog. I recommend you read them at least once a semester to remind yourself of the higher goals you should have beyond merely passing courses and accumulating credits for graduation. To me, each of these aims is like a mountain peak, or more accurately, each is like a facet of a single towering mountain that we are invited not only to look at but to climb. In many ways, we faculty can only do like the parents in the story I related. We can bring you students to the mountain, we can encourage you, and we can try to model the behavior that we hope you will choose. But you must make the effort to lift your eyes and then to scale the peak through your diligence. This university will achieve its divine destiny only as faculty, staff, and students unite and help each other in the climb upward. <clears throat> I wish to speak about each of the four aims, suggesting things that may help us ascend together. I propose that in striving to achieve the aims of a BYU education, you will simultaneously be advancing in your quest for perfection and eternal life, a quest we must always remember is made possible only through the love and the atonement of the Savior. I will start with a third aim, building character, for reasons that I think will become clear. For centuries, the ultimate goal of education in Western civilization was the formation of students' character. True, in each period of the past, students were taught what was known in every branch of learning, but they were taught such things as oratory, languages, philosophy, literature, music, and mathematics to increase their wisdom and judgment and enable them to serve their societies. Education was to engender virtue, and the morality of students was the constant concern of most teachers from ancient Greece through the first hundred plus years of the United States. In this country, up until about 1890, the last course that students took at college was moral philosophy, a course considered so important it was usually taught by the college president. Very few universities now attempt anything in the way of molding students' character. Most have capitulated to the relatively recent belief that the goal of higher education is to specialize in some area of learning so that one has the credentials to get a job and earn money, preferably lots of it. I hope you will be grateful that one of the aims of BYU is not to prepare you to become wealthy but to build your character. President Kimball taught that BYU has no justification for its existence unless it builds character, creates and develops faith, and makes men and women of strength and courage, fortitude, and service. It is not justified on an academic basis only. How can your experience at BYU help you develop the kind of Christ-like character the Ames document describes? Let me suggest a few things to consider. Your character is formed by the things you think about, the daily decisions you make, and the actions that follow. How true are the words of this old saying, so a thought, reap an action, so an action, reap a habit. So a habit, reap a character, so a character, reap an eternal destiny. How you choose to use your time, treat your family, interact with your friends and roommates, serve your employer, do your homework, fulfill your church callings, all of these decisions and actions will contribute to your character. The Honor Code aims to instill in us those moral virtues encompassed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you will follow both the spirit and the letter of the Honor Code, you will develop traits of honesty, integrity, humility, and benevolence that will make you the kind of person who is sought after as a friend, an employee, and a spouse. Your pledging to obey the Honor Code is an act of no small importance. Too many people today too easily break their promises and set aside commitments when it is no longer convenient to honor them. Such people diminish their own character and demonstrate the truth of the words spoken by Sir Thomas More in Robert Bolt's play, A Man for All Seasons. In this play, More refuses to swear to the act of succession because he cannot in good conscience approve of some of King Henry VIII's actions. When More is in danger of losing his life because of his refusal, his daughter urges him to swear the oath outwardly, but in his heart to think otherwise. More replies, what is an oath then but words we say to God? When a man takes an oath, he's holding his own self in his hands, like water. And if he opens his fingers then, he needn't hope to find himself again. 
To make any commitment and then violate your promise is to let your character dribble away like water between your fingers. Honor the commitments you have made to parents, friends, roommates, teachers, employers, your bishop, and the Lord. Your character will grow more firm and steady each time you set aside your desire to do what is right, or to do what is convenient, sorry, and instead do what is right. Let me suggest something else you might consider as you think about character development. In the October 2000 General Conference of the Church, President Boyd K. Packer told of receiving his patriarchal blessing at the age of 18 after he had entered military service. The patriarch told Brother Packer, guard and protect your body. Take nothing into it that will harm the organs thereof because it is sacred. It is the instrument of your mind and the foundation of your character. President Packer reiterated those words to all of us. Your body really is the instrument of your mind and the foundation of your character. I think of these words now as I walk across campus and pass students who have disabilities. Coping with blindness, deafness, motor impairments, and other challenges, these students have not allowed less than perfect bodies to stop them from seizing the opportunity to improve their minds. They have no doubt faced barriers in the temptation to settle for something less than a college education. But in overcoming adversity, they have built great strength of character. Their bodies, perhaps because of their disabilities, have become the foundation of a character marked by courage and persistence. It is likewise with those who battle invisible challenges of chronic illness or mental and emotional conditions. They too can forge a sterling character in the fire of adversity. The same can be true for all of us. If we realize that our body is a great gift from God and our mortal parents, <clears throat> And if we treat that body with wisdom and respect, we can all lay the foundation for a strong character. All around us today, we see two extremes where the body is concerned. At one extreme are those who seem to hate their bodies, scarring and defacing them with tattoos and multiple piercings. They use drugs and other substances that weaken and addict their bodies. To me, such people seem to have a tormented, unhappy character. At the other extreme are those who are far too vain about their bodies, much too preoccupied with appearance. Goaded by media images of models and movie stars, they try to shape their bodies into an unrealistic ideal through sometimes life-threatening practices. They spend excessively on fashion clothing and other products to use in or on the body. Trying to meet the world's narrow, shallow, and ever-changing standard of beauty, they may neglect to develop deeper, more lasting character traits. Such preoccupation with appearance calls to mind the words of Moroni, who, when he saw our day in vision, wrote this, I know that ye do walk in the pride of your hearts, and there are none save a few only who do not lift themselves up in the pride of their hearts unto the wearing of very fine apparel. For behold, ye do love money and your substance and your fine apparel more than ye love the poor and needy, the sick and the afflicted. Then he asks, Why do ye adorn yourselves with that which hath no life, and yet suffer the hungry and the needy and the naked and the sick and the afflicted to pass by you and notice them not? In another verse, he suggests an answer to his own question. People do these things for the praise of the world. They esteem being in fashion and peer approval more than they esteem their fellow men and the approbation of God. In contrast to these extremes, the gospel teaches us to make our bodies attractive by keeping them clean, neatly groomed, and modestly clothed, and to discipline our bodies by controlling our physical appetites. <clears throat> May I suggest that following a daily regimen that includes sufficient sleep, I know that's hard for students, exercise, a healthy diet, and staying clean and well-groomed can in itself contribute to the development of character. Keeping up such discipline can present a challenge to students or anyone else. Faced with homework, tests, and other responsibilities, it's easy to excuse ourselves for lapses in a healthy routine by insisting we're just too busy. But if we persist in an unwise course for very long, we find ourselves fatigued, sick, or depressed, unable to accomplish the physical and mental work we need to do. Remember the mar remarkable promise given at the end of the world, word of wisdom. And all saints who remember to keep and do these sayings, walking in obedience to the commandments, shall receive health in their navel and marrow to their bones, and shall find wisdom and great treasures of knowledge, even hidden treasures, and shall run and not be weary, and shall walk and not faint. Notice that treasures of wisdom and knowledge are promised to those who heed the commandments and the laws of physical health. As President Packer said, your body really is the instrument of your mind. 
I want to speak about the first and second aims of a BYU education, enlarging the intellect and strengthening the spirit together. As far as I can tell, when these two activities are correctly understood, you can't do one without the other. I've heard some people speak of the intellect and the spirit as if they were diametrically opposed, warning that those who engage deeply in intellectual pursuits will lose their testimonies. However, sociologists who have studied members of our church have concluded the opposite. Higher levels of education are strongly correlated with indicators of faithfulness, such as prayer and scripture study, tithing, missionary service, and temple marriage. <clears throat> this is not to say that one must have diplomas and degrees to be a stalwart member of the church. Some of the greatest spiritual giants in my life had little formal education. But I propose that those who have attained a high degree of spirituality are also those whose minds are most alive to the wonders of creation and the noblest achievements of the human race. I submit that intellectual and spiritual pursuits not only can but should be harmonized so that the most effective learning will take place as well as the learning that will contribute to our spiritual safety. The Prophet Joseph Smith taught, we consider that God has created man with a mind capable of instruction and a faculty that may be enlarged in proportion to the heat and diligence given to the light communicated from heaven to the intellect, and that the nearer a man approaches perfection, the clearer are his views and the greater his enjoyments till he has overcome the evils of his life and lost every desire for sin. This statement suggests that the intellect and the spirit are developed simultaneously and that the greater one grows in spiritual stature, the greater one will grow in intellectual ability as well. Brigham Young described the scope of our religion thus, It matters not what the subject be if it tends to improve the mind, exalt the feelings, and enlarge the capacity. The truth that is in all the arts and sciences forms a part of our religion. These familiar verses from the Doctrine and Covenants sum up well the encompassing nature of what the Lord expects us to teach and learn. Teach ye diligently, and my grace shall attend you, that you may be instructed more perfectly in theory, in principle, in doctrine, in the laws of the gospel, in all things that pertain unto the kingdom of God that are expedient for you to understand, of things both in heaven and in the earth and under the earth, things which have been, things which are, things which must shortly come to pass, things which are at home, things which are abroad, the wars and the perplexities of the nations, and the judgments which are on the land, and the knowledge also of countries and of kingdoms. This scripture describes well the education we try to give students at BYU. In your religion courses, you will be instructed more perfectly in theory, in principle, in the laws of the gospel, and in all things that pertain unto the kingdom of God. I hope you will not be dismayed when your religion professors are more rigorous and demanding than the typical Sunday school teacher. The gospel is a vast topic, and it can't be learned casually. In addition to studying the gospel, the scripture implies we should study everything else from astronomy to zoology. We often stop quoting the verses from section 88 at this point, but let us read the next verse which explains why we should learn about so many things. That ye may be prepared in all things when I, the Lord, shall send you again to magnify the calling whereunto I have called you and the mission with which I have commissioned you. This scripture states simply that the education we gain in the gospel and other fields is to prepare us for the callings that the Lord will give us. I think we could do no better than to look at the current leaders of the church to see excellent examples of people who magnify their callings precisely because they blend profound knowledge and testimonies of the gospel with broad learning and experience in various professions. For example, President Hinckley's experience with and understanding of the mass media have enabled him to represent the church in a positive light to millions who are not members. I could multiply examples, but the point is clear. The Lord and his church need people who have both spiritual understanding and excellent educational preparation. We don't know what callings may yet come to us, but we should consider every subject we study a part of our preparation. Thus, it is important to approach our studies with an inquiring and an enthusiastic attitude. Occasionally, students will ask why so many courses are required in general education. Some have even seriously suggested that if they already know what they want to major in, they shouldn't be required to take general education. Allow me to let Albert Einstein and then Brigham Young respond to that argument. Einstein said, it is not enough to teach a man a specialty. Through it, he may become a useful machine but not a harmoniously developed personality. 
It is essential that the student acquire an understanding and a lively feeling for value. He must acquire a vivid sense of the beautiful and the morally good. Otherwise, he, with his specialized knowledge, more closely resembles a well-trained dog. <clears throat> That's Einstein, not me. Uh, premature specialization on the grounds of immediate usefulness kills the spirit on which all cultural life depends, specialized knowledge included. Now Brigham Young. Let us not narrow ourselves up, for the world, with all its variety of useful information and its rich hoard of hidden treasure, is before us. And eternity, with all its sparkling, lofty aspirations and unspeakable glories, is before us and ready to aid us in the scale of advancement and every useful improvement. Can we imagine that Jesus, the creator of this earth and everything in it, lacked any kind of knowledge as he prepared to fulfill the assignment his father gave him to go down and make an earth whereon we might dwell? I urge you to give serious effort to your general education courses. Rather than think of them as something to get out of the way, think of them as a way of becoming more like the Savior and of seeing his hand in all creation. It's been said that major education prefer, prepares you to make a living, but general education prepares you to make a life. You will succeed more in your chosen profession if you're broadly educated because you'll be more versatile and more able to see how details relate to each other and create the big picture. Your employer will be able to entrust you with more responsibilities as you gain experience. Furthermore, your leisure time will be spent in a more ennobling way if you learn to appreciate good art, music, literature, drama, dance, and film than if you succumb to consuming most of the entertainments that popular culture offers you. So much of it is unworthy of your time, attention, and money. I hope you'll approach your studies with the attitude demonstrated 20-some years ago by a young man on this campus who was chosen to be a Rhodes Scholar, a rare achievement. When he won that honor, the campus newspaper published an interview in which he said that as he approached the library to study, he felt much the same way as when he approached church on Sundays to attend his meetings. Both study and worship were for him a time of spiritual edification. I commend that approach to you. This young man was an example of what Elder Neil A. Maxwell has called the disciple scholar. For a disciple of Jesus Christ, Elder Maxwell said, academic scholarship is a form of worship. It is actually another dimension of consecration. Hence, one who seeks to be a disciple scholar will take both scholarship and discipleship seriously, and likewise gospel covenants. For the disciple scholar, the first and second great commandments frame and prioritize life. How else could one worship God with all of one's heart, might, mind, and strength? Consecrated scholarship, Elder Maxwell continued, thus converges both the life of the mind and of the spirit. However, Elder Maxwell qualifies his urging that we worship God with our minds through scholarship. The first qualification is that there is no democracy among truths. Not all truths are of equal significance. The revealed truths of the gospel are more important and do take precedence over the truths that have been forged out of the collective efforts of human beings. It's good to know both, but if we must on occasion choose where to put our allegiance, we should choose revealed truths. The second qualification is this. Genius without meekness is not enough to qualify for discipleship. The disciple scholar blends intellectual traits with spiritual ones that often seem their opposite. Such a person tempers curiosity with obedience, questioning with submissiveness, zeal for knowledge with faith and humility, and striving to excel with brotherly kindness. Perhaps this is part of what is meant by the encouragement to seek learning even by study and also by faith. I recall a time when I was in a BYU ward where one of the bishop's counselors was an undergraduate student with what I judged to be fairly ordinary intellectual talents. But he had extraordinary faith and desire to obey. In a sacrament meeting, he told of an experience he had had the previous week. With a deadline for a paper looming before him, he was hard at work writing one afternoon when a knock came at the door. A member of the ward needed his help. This young counselor knew that if he took the time to serve, he would be hard-pressed to finish his paper and do a good job on it, but he chose to serve. He came back to his paper with the deadline now only hours away. He told us he knelt and asked his Heavenly Father to let words flow into his mind. When he went back to his work, his prayer was answered in just the way he had asked. Words flowed into his mind, and he was able to complete his assignment on time. He learned not only by study, but also by faith. <clears throat> Such dramatic experiences may not come to you, 
but I believe all can have experiences such as I had one Saturday afternoon in graduate school. I was wrestling with the homework in a course that required knowledge of statistics for which I lacked some of the background. As I grew more and more frustrated, I was tempted to just give up and take a zero on the assignment, knowing it would mean I would do poorly on the next test as well. But instead I prayed, and there came to me a feeling of calm and confidence that I could do this. As I went back to the homework with more faith, I found that I could figure it out, and I was able to pass the assignment and, and the test. This principle that faith contributes to learning is reinforced in Doctrine and Covenants section 130. Whatever principle of intelligence we attain unto in this life, it will rise with us in the resurrection. And if a person gains more knowledge and intelligence in this life through his diligence and obedience than another, he will have so much the advantage in the world to come. Notice that two ways we gain knowledge and intelligence are diligence and obedience. Some things we cannot learn through intellectual efforts alone. How can we know that the windows of heaven will open for us unless we tithe? How can we know the blessings of Sabbath observance unless we keep the Sabbath holy? If we are diligent, not hit and miss in our obedience, we will know things in a way we could never know by study alone. Let us remember the counsel of Nephi, to be learned is good if we hearken to the counsels of God. Such hearkening will increase our knowledge and enlarge our intellectual aptitude. Finally, let's follow the counsel given by our prophet Gordon B. Hinckley when he was a member of the Twelve nearly forty years ago. Speaking of the Savior's invitation to learn of me, President Hinckley said, With all of your learning, learn of him. With all of your study, seek knowledge of the Master. That knowledge will complement in a wonderful way the secular training you receive and give a fullness to your life and character that can come in no other way. The fourth aim of a BYU education is to prepare you for lifelong learning and service. As I stated earlier, it's not to prepare you to make a lot of money. Nevertheless, statistics show that on average those with college degrees earn significantly more than those with less education. Thus, most of you will become comparatively wealthy simply as a byproduct of earning a degree. Notice I said comparatively wealthy, and the comparison group is much of the population in the rest of the world. On an NPR program I heard recently, it was said that one billion people on this earth live on one dollar a day, and another two billion live on two dollars a day. Think of those figures as you listen to these statistics I gleaned recently from the newspaper. Almost seven billion dollars were spent in the U.S. last year on cosmetics. Some thirteen billion was spent on chocolate, another seven billion spent on videotape rentals, twenty billion at jewelry stores, and twenty-four billion at liquor stores. Altogether, that totals $71 billion. In the meantime, an organization called the Bread for the World Institute estimates that it would take only about $4 billion a year over the next 15 years to subtract 512 million people from the 800 million people worldwide who suffer from hunger. These figures challenge us all to consider whether we have the right priorities where the use of our means is concerned. Those who are privileged to enter to learn at BYU have an obligation to then go forth to serve. Let me read this long passage from the Ames. Since a decreasing fraction of the Church membership can be admitted to study at BYU, it is ever more important that those who are admitted use their talents to build the Kingdom of God on the earth. Students should learn, then demonstrate, that their ultimate allegiance is to higher values, principles, and human commitments rather than to mere self-interest. By doing this, BYU graduates can counter the destructive and often materialistic self-centeredness and worldliness that afflict modern society. A service ethic should permeate every part of BYU's activities, from the admissions process through the curriculum and extracurricular experiences to the moment of graduation. This ethic should also permeate each student's heart, leading him or her to the ultimate wellspring of charity, the love for others that Christ bestows on his followers. The pure love of Christ will fill our hearts as we serve the less fortunate. The self-centeredness of those who ignore the poor and the needy is well depicted in a mural painted by the great Latter-day Saint artist Minerva Tykert on a wall of the World Room in the Manti Temple. Part of the murals in this room show the grand march of Gentile <coughs> history from the Tower of Babel to the sailing of Columbus. In one, against the backdrop of a great and spacious building, are a number of colorful, brightly lit figures who represent the wealthy, powerful, learned, and successful people of the world, those who have made things happen and have left their mark. 
In contrast to these grand figures are a number of darker figures in the foreground that one almost doesn't notice at first. They represent a homeless family, a mother and her lame son, a crippled soldier who has lost a leg in battle, a woman holding the limp body of her child in her arms, another woman clutching her head in despair, and a family of immigrants driven by oppression to seek a, a new life in an unseen land. Surveying this mural, one realizes with shock that the rich and powerful don't even glance at the poor and needy on the margins of their worldly parade. Perhaps these words from Jacob explain how this could happen. Because they are rich, they despise the poor, and they persecute the meek, and their hearts are upon their treasures, wherefore their treasure is their God. We know that riches are not in themselves bad. Rather, it is the way we use riches that leads either to approbation or condemnation. We learn also from Jacob that if we seek first for the kingdom of God and obtain a hope in Christ, we may obtain riches if we seek them. But he adds a powerful caution. We should seek them for the intent to do good, to clothe the naked, and to feed the hungry, and to liberate the captive, and administer relief to the sick and the afflicted. As with riches, fame is not necessarily bad if it comes from doing something good. Certainly, we're grateful to know the story of Columbus, whose voyage prepared the way for a new nation where freedom would flourish and the gospel could be restored. A deed like his is worthy of mention in the world's history. But remember that one can also do important service that likely won't be recorded by historians. These words from George Eliot's Middlemarch express an important truth. The growing good of the world is partly dependent on unhistoric acts, and that things are not so ill with you and me as they might have been is half owing to the number who live faithfully a hidden life and rest in unvisited tombs. Whether you serve in relative obscurity as a parent or a primary teacher, or whether you serve in the limelight as a government official or a prominent church leader, your service is equally significant to its beneficiaries, and it is known to the Lord. I know that you students have already begun to give significant service that has been considered in the decision to admit you to the university. Let me suggest some ways you can continue to serve. One is to accept callings in your ward and stake. Another is to take a service learning course. The Jacobson Center for Service and Learning on this campus helps teachers make service an integral part of the curriculum in many courses, and it keeps track of service opportunities for which students may volunteer outside of class. The David M. Kennedy Center has several international study programs that make service in a foreign land a meaningful part of the time students spend abroad. But you don't need to travel abroad or even to turn to an organized center to find the opportunities to serve. They're all around you in your family, your ward, your apartment, your residence hall, and in your community. <clears throat> Together, the four aims aspire to promote an education that helps students integrate all parts of their university experience into a fundamentally sacred way of life. No other university I know of, except our sister campuses in Hawaii and Idaho, aspires to such a lofty goal. Because of the seriousness of what we're about, some of you may be thinking that life at BYU will be something like a cross between boot camp and a never-ending church meeting. <laughs> you may be asking yourselves, isn't there going to be any fun here? The answer, of course, is yes. You will find plenty of fun in adventures with roommates and friends, activities in your ward and residence halls, at sporting events, concerts and dances, and occasionally even in the classroom. I don't need to wish for you that you will have fun. It will happen. But I do wish for you that when you look back years from now, you will see that your college years were much more than fun. I wish for you the peace of mind that comes from knowing you honored commitments treated friends and associates in a Christ-like way and increased in self-discipline and integrity. I hope you will feel a humble gratitude from knowing that you dedicated, even consecrated yourself to improving your intellectual talents and increasing your spirituality. I pray that because you have tasted the joy that comes from service, you will seek to serve continually throughout your life. Such a sweet self-assessment can be yours years hence. If you do not content yourself now with lounging comfortably in a base camp in the foothills, when with some exertion you could be standing on the summit of a great mountain. President Kimball prophesied that Brigham Young University will one day be an educational Mount Everest. President Bateman last fall expressed his belief that BYU will play an important role in the establishment of Zion. 
I believe that will happen in large part because the students who come here will rise to the challenge of the four aims and dedicate themselves to becoming a Zion people. I express my confidence in you. You are a chosen generation, and the Lord loves you and will bless you in all your righteous endeavors. I leave you my testimony that his church and kingdom have been restored to the earth through the prophet Joseph Smith, and that his chosen servant, Gordon B. Hinckley, leads his work today. I'm grateful for that testimony, and I bear it to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. For more information on this program, please visit our website at byubroadcasting.org. This Brigham Young University devotional by Christine Hansen was given July 3, 2001.